Fine, uh, twenty eight hundred dollars for reporting on Regina's Freedom Rally. Yes, uh, apparently it is illegal for the press to report on uh, anti lockdown protest rallies, uh, discussions, things such as that. You got swept up in the works. So I'm bringing on the now criminal Lee Harding. Uh, thanks very much for joining me, Lee. Uh, it's uh, an interesting story there. Thank you for the best intro ever, the now criminal Lee Harding. Best ever. I, 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 I should have caveat. You haven't been convicted yet. It, well, no, not yet. No, no, uh, well, mind you, we're in an environment now where you're pretty much guilty until proven innocent instead of the other way around. Uh, that's why I think a lot of these people were out here, was they were seeing an end to our basic freedoms on the horizon. And that's worth covering. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I mean, people need to push back. I mean, that's why every modern um, charter of rights, constitution, those sorts of things that every developed country has, there's a number of things that are essential freedoms that are always packed into those. Uh, expression, uh, association, speech, you know, these things are all critical and, and they're all being uh, pushed and, and, you know, pushed back on and, and crushed a bit with these pandemic restrictions. They're using section one of the charter as a justification to kind of set these rights aside right now. I think we're going to be discussing for a lot of years and whether they were justified in doing so. But another one is free press. So how did you get swept up in the bunch uh, when, when you were just there to cover it rather than, you know, you, I imagine you weren't standing on the stage, you know, waving a sign and giving speeches or anything. No, no. Uh, who knows? They might have me on stage if there's a next time just to tell the story of how far things are getting. But no, I wasn't there to do that at all. And I haven't been a groupie for these things. I mean, they've had rallies almost weekly for months and months. Uh, I went to one casually last summer. My friend said, hey, you want to go see it? Sure. Let's see what's happening. Well, there was more people that particular day in the summer who were uh, celebrating Mohammed's grandson and uh, acknowledging him in, in his principles and whatnot at the legislature steps that day. I went when Chris Skye was there. I wrote an article on that and I had, this was a very good opportunity to talk to some people at this particular rally because Maxine Bernier was there, Laurelyn Tyler Thompson was there, uh, Art Pulowski was supposed to be there and uh, he got arrested on the highway there before that he could get over and uh, Mark Friesen uh, who is a PPC candidate and who has a YouTube channel in his own right and there were some others and I mean, what better opportunity? So that's why I was there. And <clears throat> what happened was I was following uh, the, the entourage of speakers out to uh, their vehicle where they were going to go to the next event. So I was still asking questions, talking to them in the parking lot. Okay, it's time to go. And then the police showed up and gave them tickets. And Laura Lynn gave the police officer writing her up a little lesson on uh, some other ways to treat Corona and why this was overblown. I don't know if he was listening or not. He, at the end of it, said, I was surprised you got that out. It was almost in one breath. Then uh, the, uh, you know, Bernier said, uh, I'm happy to get this ticket. I am fighting for Canada and I'm going to put this in my office wall. So he did that. And then I said, I'm a member of the press. Are you going to ticket me as well? And I said, well, you might not want to go back to the park there. Uh, you know, on your way home, uh, da, 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 da. Well, I was walking by the park and then I heard a rapper uh, from the stage and I used to freestyle and battle and all that kind of stuff. And this is someone I wanted to talk to. So when the performance was done, I went back, I, I made sure I didn't miss him, talked to him for an interview. Uh, we got him on the walkway out for a picture. We were walking out of the park and that's when the police arrested him well not arrested but ticketed him and myself and he was quite happy to get a ticket he was a martyr for the cause and of course it never hurt a rapper to be in an altercation with the police i mean that sounds like street cred to me so he he was of a different attitude of that uh, i you know was not looking to get a ticket i was not looking to be uh, a martyr for the cause and uh, i think 2800 dollars hurts just about everybody but bill gates but it, uh, you know, it's not like I'm flush with cash either. And so, you know, I didn't really need that, but it's a sign of the times. I mean, I, the policeman, he, I said, no, I'm here doing interviews. That's why I'm here. And uh, he says, uh, well, can you show me your press credentials? Well, do you think an, an illegal event issues press credentials? No. So I showed him my portfolio for Western Standard and for another organization that I write for. 
And um, he says, why weren't you wearing your mask? Why weren't you social distancing? Well, that's completely irrelevant to an outdoor gathering. I mean, it's, it's, it's the 11th person makes everyone liable to a $10,000 fine. So uh, anyway, he wrote me up and the maximum fine has been increased to 10,000, but they have not used any of those $10,000 fines yet. This whole thing is so political. What's remarkable was in advance of this very important rally, they increased the fines from 2,800 to 10,000, the maximum fines. And then I did a story for Western Standard on Saskatchewan's queen of fines, which is Tamara Lavoie. And she says, I don't care what these fines are, whether they're 2,800, 10,000, they're illegal and, and they're not gonna stop me. So then they, I think they decided, well, let's not make any martyrs of people by actually using this $10,000 fine. And while this rally was going on, on a Saturday afternoon, that's when the premier decided that they were going to announce that the public gathering limits were going to be 150 instead of just 10. So at the same time, they're saying, well, in three weeks, 150 will be fine. But today, the 11th one is criminal. You know, they're, they're announcing this. This is a very political endeavor that's going on here. This is not about medicine. It's not about science. And to see the JCCF in this last week bring forward some very damning evidence about the PCR test is very significant, too, because they've been cycling them at 40 and there's still a substantial amount of errors, even at a lower amount. And the PCR test founder, when he was still alive, he said, they're, they're misusing my test. And uh, he also had some very damning words about Anthony Fauci. And he says, these people have their own agenda. They make up their own rules as they go. And he says, it's not the agenda that we would want, given that our tax dollars in some way go to them to pay for our health. So there, there's lots uh, rotten in the state of Denmark, as they might say. Yeah, well, in Saskatchewan's numbers, uh, you're not in as uh, dire a condition as Alberta has been lately. And Alberta has actually plateaued and, and uh, seems to be stabilizing. Thankfully, you know, the deaths are way, way down. And we're seeing that everywhere. Uh, you know, that's a separate debate as to why and, and things such as that. But uh, so, I mean, the crackdowns it seem excessively harsh out there when you guys really haven't had as, as much of a problem with the uh, infections on the go anyways. Yeah, it's all about crushing a movement, really. And... It really surprises me. I mean, the first reports in the Leader Post about this gathering, oh, there were very few people. There were 16 people who were gathered. Really? Well, it said there were 16 people who were ticketed, and they showed a picture that, it, from the way it was framed, looked like there was not that many people there. Well, you know, we gave coverage to it and showed that there were hundreds and showed the fact that the Leader Post had lied in one of my commentaries on this. And in the one sense, I've heard them estimate, oh, there's about 200 there. I think there was more than that. I know Bernier thought there was more like 500 there. So there's, you know, they're trying to say that this is a small group of people, that this is fringe. And then the way that it's being covered, say, you know, really cast these people as kooks. I mean, this morning, the article I wrote on Nathan Linchuk, which again, would not have even happened if I hadn't gone to this event, the Saskatoon policeman who basically left the forest over this because Oh my gosh, he took his children to a, a children's rally, a freedom rally, where there was, oh no, a clown and bubbles and a hula hoop. And the mayor's calling this, you know, insane super spreader event, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, uh, Linchuk is looking at it going, you know, if you're going to chastise me for bringing my kids to a, an event in the park, I, I'm, I'm out. You're not going to have a hearing and cast me as the bad guy. Why did you do this? And plus, he says, if I've got my fellow cops that are taking pictures of me, handing them into my boss, is not talking to me first and whatnot, and then doing that, he says, uh, trust is a lot as being a policeman. And you don't have trust in your fellow officers or the trust of your fellow officers. It's already over. So he was a person of principle. He says, I can't look my kids in the eye because he says, we could have communism here in a few years or sooner. And uh, when they look at me and say, Dad, why didn't you do something? So, you know, he's he's not looking for fame either. He says, I'm I'm not a gifted public speaker. He said, I, I, I'm uncomfortable doing these things. But he says, somebody has to stand up. And But you look in the media, in the mainstream media, and he's basically being cast as a kook. You know, oh, my gosh, one of those people, one of those people fought, you know, whatever. And But never framed in a way where, uh, you know, you can fully appreciate... Uh, 
what it is and why he's doing it. So I, I, I shouldn't say that. I think there was a time later, about a week later, where they, or two weeks after his resignation, where they did try to give him some air. But I think there's this consciousness in the back of the mainstream media mind that, you know, if, if it ever ends up being that this article is enough to actually sway someone from not being a, um, a skeptic to being someone who's you know, sympathetic to one of these protesters, well, maybe that's going too far. So, you know, there's always a limit as to how they will frame something, how they will look at it. And uh, so I think people, we really need a discerning public. And unfortunately, it's almost like the They Live movie where in 1988 or around there where Rowdy Roddy Piper, he, he has these glasses and with these glasses, he can see through uh, the signal that is blinding people. And so he's seeing reality through a whole new lens. And so he's begging these people, put on the glasses, put on the glasses. And his friend won't do it. And he thinks, uh, you know, his his friend's a murderer. <laughs> and so they have this fight. And basically he forces these glasses on him where a person can finally see. And I find with so many issues around this, it, it's like that, whether it's uh, risks of the vaccines, whether it's uh, just, uh, you know, social distancing and whatnot. And, and I see these people that are otherwise intelligent posting why don't people just listen to the science? It's so clear. Our authorities are clear. Well, our authorities might be all singing from the same hymn book, but that doesn't mean that it's the right tune. No, and we, we've turned people against each other, and that's one of the most distressing things at all, the mobbing, the shaming. Uh, you know, at, at an event, uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm more afraid of clowns than I would be of, of the COVID at such a thing, uh, particularly when if we want to follow the science, if there's anybody who's at very, very, very little risk of transmission or attaining or getting harm from COVID, it's children. Uh, we, we should be thankful for that. As far as bugs go, I mean, I, I, if there's anything we want to save, it's our children. So we've been fortunate in that sense. And we need to cover these events. I mean, super spreader, there's a term they love throwing out there all the time. When we were at the rodeo almost two weeks ago tomorrow, well, two weeks ago tomorrow, everybody's been saying, wait two weeks, wait two weeks. Well, Dave Naylor has been in touch with Alberta Health Services and the amount of cases from our super spreader event remains at zero. It's a goose egg, not a single one. We're contact tracing. People are out there. They're looking. Look, if that rodeo is going to spread it, we would have known it by now. It didn't happen. It didn't happen when uh, Houston had a baseball game. It didn't happen when the Super Bowl happened. It didn't happen when people got together at Sylvan Lake in Alberta. But what we do see happening, we had that, you might have seen it in the standard, a, a, a student from Olds College it was found that she was at the rodeo and they were actually threatening her ability to finish her classes. Thankfully, that turned around when the Western Standard reported on it. Uh, we saw a couple of nurses that, again, social media police, self-appointed police folks uh, outed them and reported them to Alberta Health Service saying, these are people who attended the rodeo. They've been put at risk. They should be fired. They should be quarantined. They should be shot. They should be skinned, whatever else. It depends on which hysteric lunatic you're listening to online who is pushing these things. But we've really turned ourselves into this, this this mob that we're at each other's throats. I mean, and, and the state is feeding that and, and it's really distressing. And that's why we need press to report on these events to show they aren't dangerous, they aren't killing people, they aren't necessarily that insane. I mean, there's a handful of lunatics, there always will be, but for the most part, they're just concerned people. And when you're charging press for reporting on that, that's a really scary precedent. Oh, I agree with that. You know, I think this is new territory. And when you look at what they did to Rebel News, I mean, where they've, they're they renting a houseboat from Airbnb for the reporters out there in mid-April, and there are 50 police that are surrounding this houseboat and not letting anyone in or out, and then arresting David Menzies and saying, well, we'll, we'll release him if you let us go through your stuff. Uh, that's, that's just a whole new level. And we knew that Montreal was a city of corruption, but this is, this is the next level. And... I don't know. It's a sign of the times, really. So, you know, Linchuk gets it. He's like, look, at if, if we keep going the direction we're going, where are we going to end up? And uh, if anyone thinks this is still about the disease, I encourage them to think a lot more broadly than that, because it's a lot like climate change. I mean, we just heard a bunch of facts where none of the things are really working, the, the measures that they're doing. The measures are a big pretense. It's ending up in the dump. So what is this all of the all of this about in the environmental movement? Is it really actually about the environment, or is the environment a specific means to an end to get certain kind of regulations and controls, a mentality of scarcity, et cetera, into the public mind? So, yeah, I mean, people need to wake up and open their eyes a bit, and uh, and really, 
you know, a lot of people who are concerned say, well, how can we stop this? And I do think that's a very important question. And I think that's the selfless question. But I think there's other ways that we need to start looking at this. And that is, uh, if if Canada is going to head on this road that we and we can't stop it, is it time to move? Is it time to leave Canada? Uh, like the some of the Mennonites did when they could see the Bolshevik Revolution, where it was going to end up, and they came to Canada generations ago. Uh, or like Art Pulowski says, well, you know, I came in 1995 and they promised freedom here and it's not looking like that right now. And I know where this can end up because I've seen it. I grew up in it. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is concerning. I think one thing people can do because the food prices have gone up and I don't think we've seen the end of that is if you are any non-perishable food that you want, you should be buying it right now. Because if there's 10 or 12 percent increase in inflation by the end of the year, well, you just save yourself 10 percent at the best uh, you know, at, at, at the worst case scenario and the best benefit, uh, it's going to be hard to get out there and, and there'll be food shortages. But at the worst, eh, you know, you save yourself 10 percent. Yeah, you got some shelf space uh, that uh, all got taken up with some cans of food, but you're going to eat it. So I think there's certain things that people can do right now to to uh, prepare for worst case scenarios. But it's certainly time to speak up. And I think uh, people need to when they're looking at things, stop uh, Googling them and start looking them up on DuckDuckGo. Uh, there, there was one video where you can take it or leave it, but Dr. Sherry Tenpenny talked about eight ways the mRNA vax can kill you. I don't know if it's going to kill you. It's going to, it could uh, be bad for immunity instead of better. But if you look that up on uh, Google, you can't even find it. And if you look it up on DuckDuckGo, you can see uh, a whole screen full uh, of that video exactly as it is. So people are being protected, quote unquote, from certain information. And uh, the only information we see about these doctors is that they're quacks and kooks, except we see that they're not. They're actually well qualified. They have a different opinion, but they've become the heretics. They've become the Galileos, the Copernicuses of uh, our time, where uh, there's a church of sorts that doesn't want that opinion out there. And they will persecute and brand and and brand as a heretic and uh, you know burn at the stake almost if they could uh, anyone who has a different opinion. You know, well, let's pivot a bit. Actually, I'll get to one of your other stories since you're talking about that and cost of living and how it's going to go up. So uh, I was talking uh, again with Chris Sims of the Taxpayers Federation earlier, and, and part of what they were putting out was how carbon taxes aren't uh, actually reducing emissions. So again, it's just a tax grab. They're not actually having any impact. Uh, you wrote recently though, on, uh, as well, carbon taxes and the impact on agricultural producers, because it's an area people are thinking about when they're filling up to go to the soccer game or something, but they're forgetting these get applied all over the place. And that trickles all the way down to you as a consumer, no matter which way you go about it. And it's really putting pressure on our, our ag community. Uh, can you expand a bit on your article there? Well, there's a few things going on there. Uh, yes, I mean, there are signs, first of all, with the initial thing here that the prices are going up. Now, when we saw the uh, the thing that was happening in 2008, when there was a massive injection of government money, it didn't really trickle into the economy because for, for various reasons. And the Bank of Canada wound that down quite quickly to get its balance sheets back to normal. Well, this time around, we're not seeing that. We're already seeing the early signs of inflation. And the debate amongst economists is really, when is it going to hit? And uh, that's another reason to, again, spend, uh, except maybe on lumber right now, because it's a crazy price. But if you know you're going to spend it in the next year, you better spend it now. Uh, now, with regards to the carbon tax on agricultural uh, matters, yeah, I mean, it's going to be another thing that drives up the cost. And uh, talking to Trevor Tombe or other economists about this, the fact that you have a carbon tax, even if they rebate it all back, let alone do air and O'Toole's dumb idea of a, of a points program. But even if you rebate it all back, it does affect the economy. And so agricultural producers have very large input costs. Uh, you know, there, it, it costs a lot to put in uh, gas or diesel in your tractor. And they have lots of input costs with greenhouses for those who are using them and, and, um, and other ways that uh, even with feed and whatnot, it, it costs. So they are... Uh, as a producer absorbing a lot of these consumption uh, taxes on carbon, basically. So, yeah, I mean, it's a concern for them, and they are trying to exempt in any way that they can through the Agriculture Carbon Alliance. They are trying to lobby the government to acknowledge uh, the carbon sinks that are in their land, which uh, the government is doing for the ones since 2017, but again, the more 
conscientious or, or maybe foreseeing farmers that did it before then, they're not getting any credit for it, so they want it. Uh, there is a conservative bill that's going to exempt some of that if it passes, but they want to see exemptions from carbon tax even further, not just on their fuel, but on other input costs. So, I mean, good luck to them. Um, one of the problems that uh, John Robson has seen, who is the history professor at Augustine College, but also has a forum for talking about climate change, he says, as soon as you concede the argument on climate change, you really have conceded the carbon tax. As soon as you say it's this man-made contribution that is the crucial and major factor in worldwide ecology and climate change, then he says, you know, it's very hard to have the moral argument against a carbon tax. And he says the fact that neither the conservatives nor most groups are willing to uh, uh, debate in that, which, again, part of the reason they don't is, is there is this uh, sort of um, a conformist kind of almost religious belief that uh, this is man-made climate change. And and again, if you say anything or present any evidence contrary to that, the council culture says you shouldn't. So you can't even make that argument. So, of course, if you have arguments you can't make, you have conclusions you can't refute because you're not allowed to. So, yeah, I mean, it's a problem. And one of the things that I did, I'm also a research uh, associate for the Frontier Center of Public Policy. And last year, I looked at everything that Tides Foundation is funding. And it's pretty stark when you look at this because it's not just oil and gas and pipelines. It's every aspect of the research uh, of the resource sector, including forestry and agriculture. So this, this is going to hamper everything that Canada produces. And we are a resource-based economy. So if you wipe that out, I'm not sure what you have left. You have a service economy and you might have some high tech, but we're it's not like we keep all the brightest minds either. And uh, with the math curriculum, the way it is in some of these provinces, I, I don't even know if our kids are going to be able to add two plus two. Yeah, well, and, and we're heading into, there's no doubt about it. I mean, we're, we're in hard times. We're heading for harder times. I mean, we, we've put everything on the credit cards to get through this year. It's going to lead to inflation. It's going to lead to uh, other challenges. I mean, a, a great number of businesses have gone out of business and they won't be coming back. Um, something I, I'm exploring more, but a large number of businesses that are open right now, they're hanging in there only because of the current subsidies. They're getting wage subsidies, they're getting rent subsidies. But when that comes to an end, they're shuttering their doors too. So we're going to have unemployment, we're going to have closed businesses, massive government debt, inflation. I know I'm just sounding like the, the apocalypse is coming, but this is scary stuff. And we got to pay attention. And so we should be looking to what can we do domestically to keep that cost of living down while we recover? What can we do to make it affordable? And of course, energy ties into everything. So I'm tying into, you'd written recently on line five. Now, Gretchen Whitmer, speaking of lunatic uh, environmentalists, the, the governor of, of uh, Michigan, is it, she looks very dedicated to shutting that line down by any means. The environmentalists are starting to uh, line up behind her. They're starting to find native activists to put at the front of the line. It's turned into a battleground. Um, you wrote recently on the impacts of, of a line five shutdown and, and it's gonna impact a lot of us. I mean, uh, East and West. Some people are kind of looking forward to it in a sense. I gotta admit, I've said a little bit of it just for a reality check, you know, guys, this is what happens when you shut down your domestic ability because that's what we're doing. But all the same, it's gonna have a very big impact on a lot of people and, and you wrote on that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, well, yeah. You know, it was interesting talking to Dan McTee, the former Liberal MP who's now in charge of Canadians for Affordable Energy, which he founded. He said, I have been trying to warn people about this for years. And he says, nobody wanted to pay attention to me until just recently at the 11th hour when we could lose everything. Oh, is this a public issue? Yes, it is. He says, if we'd have had Energy East approved, it wouldn't have been so bad. You know, they'd be much closer by now. If Well, actually, if it had been approved in the early stages, it would have been done by now. But he says, if we had that, we wouldn't have all our eggs in one basket. But as it is, you've got a 45% loss to Ontario's uh, fuel supply and its refinery supply if Line 5 gets shut down. And also for Quebec, it's about the same numbers. Line 5 feeds into Line 9, which goes to Quebec. And some of the Western independence people like Barry Cooper, who I enjoy talking to at the University of Calgary, he says, you know, the, the, the worse damage is does the better in, in a perverse way for the East to understand the West's pain when it just keeps shutting down pipelines. Because you can have this imaginary economy where you don't need any fossil fuels and pipelines are bad and oil is bad. But as soon as you see the prices triple 
which some analysts say could actually happen if line five was shut down. As soon as that happens, boy, you know, they're going to really, really be missing that fossil fuel and realize that they cannot live without it. And maybe they should not have been so smug. But this is bad for Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, because line five provides a lot for them as well. It takes a lot of the Western oil, mostly from us, actually. And then it'll start out at, at the western edge uh, of the Great Lakes. And then it heads through uh, mostly under the ground. But there's about a four mile stretch where it goes through the Strait of Mackinac. And uh, then it, it comes out. So they want to eventually put this in a concrete corridor. So they're still working on that. But in the meantime, Whitmer wants to shut it down. And the latest thing she did just on Wednesday was to say, well, uh, if this continues, as far as we're concerned, it's illegal now. And we will just basically take away all revenue from Enbridge from any money it makes from now on. So this is somebody who is basically putting the poison pill to their own economy without good reason. And uh, there hasn't been, I mean, there was a couple of times where anchors and different things hit this pipeline in 2018 and 2019, didn't cause any harm, but uh, the, the, she's, she's, uh, she's very alarmist and she's disturbing. This is the same woman who a year ago banned seeds from being sold in stores because of Corona, you know, so you couldn't plant your garden. So people don't like her. And again, she's not for the people. And we're seeing far too much of this is there are people in government right now, whether they're in Calgary, whether they're in Ottawa, whether they're in Lansing, Michigan, or wherever their capital is, that are not for the people. And so what are the people going to do? Just sit and take it? Well, yeah, and a lot of this is based on a lie. And and the thing is, one has to look at somebody like Gretchen Whitmer, and there's a lot of Gretchen Whitmers out there, but she's an ideologue. And unfortunately, with an ideologue, you can't reason with them. And, you know, the lie that's being exposed is that, as you pointed out, there's been a couple of anchor strikes. It got people concerned. Okay, fair enough. It is a concern. You wouldn't want something that moves half a million barrels of fuel a day to suddenly start leaking into the Great Lakes. So let's address this. And Enbridge did. They said, we are going to case it in concrete. We're going to upgrade it. This thing ran safely for nearly 70 years. But you know what? There's a, a risk presenting itself. And we are going to tunnel and change that so that that risk doesn't present itself. Now, Whitmer knows this. But the problem she has, the reality, and again, this gets back to the lie and the idealism, is that if they do that, then that pipe will run for another 50 to 70 years. And that's what she doesn't want. It's that anti-petroleum fanaticism that we just have to shut down this infrastructure using any excuse and means possible. And then somehow, you know, unicorn, unicorn piss will appear and we will be able to power our homes on it. But, you know, that's where the problem is. And that's where the standoff is. And I don't see... You know, people are saying it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Well, I don't see where the intervention is going to come from to change it. Maybe the American courts will step up, but Biden's obviously staying way the hell out of this one. So what might save people from this? Boy, I, I don't know. Save yourself or call out on God to save you. I really, I mean, whatever it is, it's not going to be the politicians. I, I think that it needs to be the people. And, um, you know, it's interesting. It's sometimes you see some cues for the future in some science fiction shows. I've been looking at some of the old episodes of The Outer Limits, and uh, there was this person who was bred in a government facility in the future in a hatchery and was a soldier all of his life, and somehow he went through some anomaly and time traveled back to the past, and so he's learning English better, and he's asking, what is government? What is this? And uh, he said, this is the people who make decisions for us because we let them. Okay, so I thought, wow, now there's some social commentary from 1964 that still applies. Uh, it, this is scary. You know, we've had a good run in the West for a long time. You know, we haven't had wars on our shores. We, we've had democracy and whatnot. But I think we need to start looking at the scenarios that happened in Nazi Germany. Uh, and people are, could be saying, people like me, okay, you're on the wrong side of history. Well, if you're in 1933, you're on the wrong side of history. But in 1946, you're looking pretty good. And I remember reading, uh, actually hearing an interview and it was called the blind spot and it was to Hitler's secretary. She was just taken from a clerical pool in the late four in the towards the end of the war, you know, 1944 or so. And so she was up close with Hitler, really had no idea what the Nazis were about. And so she recounted in this interview some of her observations and what was happening at the end in the bunker and kind of the dire mood as the bombs got closer. She said after the war, she saw a memorial to somebody who spoke out against the Nazis a young woman who paid the price for it. And she looked at that and she's like, wow, this girl was my age and somehow she saw it and why didn't I? 
and she was right there with as Hitler's secretary. And as a, a woman who was 80 at this interview, she said, I am just now beginning to forgive myself. So, you know, there's the opportunity for people watching this to see, and uh, I, I encourage them to look deeper. Uh, I really hate the fact that the Saskatchewan government is holding our own children hostage and saying, if you vaccinate 70% of them with the COVID shot, well, then we can open things up again. So they are make, making these people's political pawns. And uh, I've got teenage daughters that this is going to affect if they choose to get this vaccine. And, uh, and I don't really you know, have the final say in this in the situation. So I'm, I'm concerned for them. And really, when you look at the infection rates for kids, they, they should not be getting a vaccine that we have developed in record time a fraction of the record time of any previous vaccine, which is not even actually a vaccine in the traditional sense. They're not working by the methodology of having a weak version of a COVID virus, uh, because it's kind of weak as it is anyway. Uh, they're using a completely different kind of methodology. And uh, we're seeing some disturbing side effects in the short term and some in the long term, even by people who've been uh, close to people with the vaccine. Now, this may sound weird if you've never heard it, but there's even people whose menstrual cycles, if they've been near someone with the vaccine, it's all going wonky. We're seeing postmenopausal and prepubescent girls that are having vaginal bleeding uh, that are because of their proximity to someone with the vaccine. But all of these kinds of otherwise normally very disturbing, would be made public kind of things, uh, they're being suppressed because it might be call, uh, causing vaccine hesitancy and the doctors that speak out about it are getting chastised and uh, threatened with losing their license and silence and this kind of thing. This is East, this is communist East Germany kind of tactics. This is terrible. Yeah, and, and to get back to, you know, and as you said, like, I, I don't think there's anybody as motivated or as horrible in the background as, as Hitler at this point, but the principles are the same in the problem. And as you pointed out with your analogy, I mean, things were almost easier for, for lunatics like him and sick buggers to pull off what he did. Your average German on the ground did not really actually know what was going on in those outside areas. They would, they're they human. They would have been mortified to realize there was such mass extermination. I mean, there were issues going on. But, you know, that's a whole separate show and discussion. But what it gets to is the importance of free flow of information and communication among people. We are at one of the most empowered times well we are at the most empowered time of human history for information i mean the government is trying its hardest through c10 and through other things to stem the flow of information uh and, and i mean hey you know vaccine concerns other things there's debates to be had some are right and some are wrong but the only way to do it is through communication stifling the voices doesn't aid any of us. We need to keep those communication lines full. And it, it's distressing to see that the government feels the better way to deal with this is to step on individual rights rather than try and bring it in the open then and make your case. If you're right, make your case and let's debate it. Oh, absolutely. You know, one of the interesting things that when you look deeper at the whole Nazi phenomenon is that when the Cold War ended, those Nazi scientists, uh, well, some of them, they're completely unaccounted for. Some of them went into the United States in Operation Paperclip, and the others went into Russia, and they just kept on going. And so the the, um, the research that they gained and that some of the mentality has seeped into some things. But when I went to Yad Vashem, and if, you, if viewers go to fcpp.org and read Lessons I Learned from Yad Vashem, when I went there in 2009, and this is the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, I had some very deep impressions from talking to the tour guide who was there. And I mean, the, first of all, when the Jews started to be exterminated, even the Jews, they heard rumors of it, but they couldn't believe it themselves. They could not believe that uh, people in Poland or wherever else would be doing this to them or this be happening in Treblinka, would be happening in these other places. And they actually had to send someone to find out, really, an emissary. And after that, eventually, even though they were half starved by then, they finally decided to break out of the Warsaw ghetto and, and you know, found out that they could. And when you think also of, uh, even when you look at the sound of music, I mean, there's a part in there where she says, well, how did you know my dad was on vacation? He says, well, we make it our business to know everything about everybody. Well, this was the very same thing that uh, uh, Vizinski had for, he predicted in 1971. He said that the the authorities will, the technology will be there for the authorities to know even people's personal habits. And I mean, this is our cell phones. Every app goes out. 
they're, they're list, the app is listing all the time because so you can talk to it to tell it where, where you should be driving or, you know, uh, Siri, what about blah, 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 and then it'll tell you something. Or if you get on Louder with Crowther, you ask it who Jesus Christ was and he'll tell you he, he was a fictional character and you ask it who Muhammad was and he'll, they'll give you a biography. Um, so, I mean, some of these things are happening, but she says, remember, she says, this is the tour guide in Yad Vashem. She says, remember, all of this happened in a democracy. Right. So if you think that Canada is all great and everything, I mean, Germany was very cultured, but it had economic desperation because of World War One and the reparations put on it. And that economic desperation led to a Hitler. So if we have economic desperation imposed on us in Canada uh, and, and you have people thinking that government tracing and contact tracing and knowing everyone who's related to everyone and everywhere they go, all of a sudden this becomes uh, advantageous somehow. Well, you add economic desperation to that, and we can have our own Hitler. And uh, I would, you know, I wouldn't call uh, Trudeau a Hitler, but as far as this liberal government is listening to the people, it might as well be a dictatorship because they don't care about us out here. That's for sure. No, we, we've been spoiled, and we always presume that the government's benevolent. And it's because, for the most part, that's what we've had. But we can't forget that there are uh, people who will take. That, that authority, that ability, those powers, and they will use them for ends that don't uh, aren't in the interest of the people on the ground. It, it, it's a concept that's being lost. Um, that came back with talking actually a bit with Chris Sims. We've given up personal responsibility. We want the government to do everything for us. Anytime we got a problem, we ask the government to take care of it. In fact, anytime we got a problem, if the government doesn't take care of it, we blame them for it. I mean, some of it, we're telling them to control us. We're telling them to run our lives. And, and we're voluntarily giving away the ability to speak up for ourselves. As you said, Siri is there, it's listening to us, it's sharing that data. But you know what? It wasn't, there was no gun to our head. We bought it. We set it up. We did it. We, uh, you know, gave up our right to that privacy. Every time we ask the government, you're responsible for my health care, you're responsible for my financial well being, you're responsible for the climate. Well, you're empowering them and, and you're taking all the responsibility away from them yourself. And, and, and that's a problem we have as a society. And, and again, I, I, my only hope is that that's why I get most worked up when it comes to the freedoms is when they try to control information though. That's the only way we can get ourselves out is if we can communicate, share the experiences, share the happenings, report on them as you did reporting. And that's where it's so disturbing to see you fined for reporting on an incident and, you know, and, and people getting shut down, screamed at, canceled for putting out different points of view. No, throw it all into the mix. We've got a lot of smart people. We've got a lot of discussion. We've got a little discourse. And most often, not always, but most often the best answers will come out in the end rather than trying to control it. And, and control is a scary thing. Well, it is. You know, and, and let's, okay, one of my friends who's otherwise intelligent, he's, he said this a few months ago. He says, now, I hate this because somebody's going to put a post on here saying that they shouldn't take the vaccines because of some what some kook says and then, uh, grandma's going to be dead and my kids are not going to be able to see their grandma because blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, whoa, okay, now wait a second here. Um, first of all, you're banking on the fact that these people have nothing good to say because uh, you're not listening to them either. You're not giving them the time of day and you think they should be censored. But the other thing is what happened to people making their own decisions based on the information that they encounter? You know, because we all encounter different information. We judge whether we think that information comes from a source that knows what they're talking about and for good reason we assess that and then we make our own decisions so uh, you know when you control the flow of information you're starting to control the thoughts of the people just to leave them the illusion of having a fully informed and reasoned choice when they don't have it anymore i mean this was the thing if you read i always encourage people to read edward bernays's 1928 book propaganda and you can find it on the website historyisaweapon.org but he basically says there back in, in the day and when public relations, and he's the father of public relations, but it's in a very infant form back then. And he says, uh, the, the invisible government of the world is basically people who control the minds of people. Now, he wasn't yet, he was hinting at it, but he wasn't really saying this is a council of people in the room or anything. But he says, the propagandists control the world. So the, the people that make, a, make things cool so that we buy them, the people that put the ideas out, they're the ones really controlling things. And he said, even the, the people that we elect by popular demand, it's only because you had a big campaign to make them that way. He was part of the Creel Commission that got America into World War I. Woodrow Wilson campaigned on the fact that he kept America out of the war. 
1916, and then he put America into the war. He put propaganda to work, censoring the mailing at the post office of the anti-war groups was part of the way of doing it. So here you have a government institution that's used as a mandate of censorship and people don't even know it. And then all of a sudden, the people are demanding that America enter World War I, even though they just elected someone on the premise that he didn't, you know, and all this goes on. So he said, we realize as governments, uh, they realize that they could propagandize people to some extent against their own will and make them move. And he basically, he was Freud's nephew and he said, we can, uh, use the basic human motivations on a mass social scale uh, and use those currents to our advantages. And if you look at some of the things Bernays did, the fact that we eat bacon and eggs for breakfast in the morning is because he had a campaign and he used a poll of doctors to get this result to say that a hearty morning breakfast was better. He got women to smoke because he was hired by a tobacco company and uh, he, he did a few public relations events and a few um, kind of uh, subtler things, uh, even involving the fashions in Paris that would use the color of uh, Lucky Strike cigarettes so that the logo became a cool color and then women would want to, uh, you know, they'd be more inclined to buy it. I mean, there was a whole bunch of subtleties and things that you never thought would be connected, that if you were to identify them, you would have to be uh, thought of a nut job conspiracy theorist to say that they had anything to do with it. But he propagandized the people and even led a revolution in one of the countries uh, that had uh, taken away some of the interests of uh, Alan Dulles and his brother, uh, who had investments in uh, this company and were losing because of what the new government was doing. And I mean, uh, I encourage people to look at that. Uh, there's some good YouTube videos on it. There's uh, the propaganda book. And um, the, the same thing is happening today. We, and, and this is a really interesting thing, and I know this is a bit of an aside, but I think it's important is that what Bernays said is, he says, we could imagine some people who were making the best decisions that were experts in every field, but the people wouldn't have it because they insist on this thing on democ called democracy. So he says, that's where propaganda comes in. So his whole premise is we make the people do what we want them to do by propaganda, making them believe it's their own idea. And this, this is so, you know, what democracy has become is it's almost like when you have the kid that uh, is maybe five years old, he doesn't know how to play the video game and he wants to, and you hand him a joystick that doesn't do anything. And you say, hey, you're playing too now. And they're, and they're like, and once in a while they go, I don't, don't think I'm doing anything. No, no, you're doing great. You're playing great. And you just let him think he's doing something. So, you know, we're the, the propaganda uh, is, is at a high level right now. Uh, we have uh, through Google search engines and different techniques that they do, uh, we're more inclined to pick the first thing on the screen and say, whatever our search engine said, that's probably the article I should read. And this has been proven many times uh, through many different studies. So we are we are getting led, we are getting herded. And then once in a while, you get a sheep that wants to run out and, uh, and say that, you know, I, I don't want to be shepherded in this way. I don't even think these shepherds are doing anything but leading us to the slaughter. And, you know, you have the other sheep trying to round them up and say, no, don't leave. No, this shepherd is for our good. Well, that's great. It's been quite a, a discussion and we're getting up against the clock and I appreciate that. And yeah, uh, information, again, it, it's a double-edged sword, you know, and it can be abused and, and taken against us by the state, as you said, and in subtle ways and, and indirect ways. And I, again, my view of it is the, the only cure for it is just more access to information and eventually we, we'll, we'll figure it out. We can have different points of view and hopefully come to a uh, rational conclusions in the end, but we've got to stand up for our rights or they will be taken away from us. There's there's no getting around that. It happens every time. So thanks for having and coming on for such a great chat. And thanks for your work out in Saskatchewan, keeping us up to date on what's happening out there. I hope and look forward to hearing that you beat that $2,800 fine because uh, yeah, I'm certain you got better things you could do with that kind of money. Uh, where where yeah. can we find more information on what you're up to? Well, uh, Western Standard, you can click on my name and see everything that I wrote there. As well, I also write for Epic Times. I'm usually doing three articles for them a week. And as well, I write commentaries and do the occasional long research thing for Frontier Center, which is fcpp.org. I have a YouTube channel that uh, has the logo Lee TV, but the name is Lee Harding. And uh, boy, if you do all that, you're, you're listening to me an awful lot. Well, that's excellent, Lee. I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. I'm looking forward to your future pieces. Oh, well, thank you very much, Corey. I enjoy your show. I think it's important. And I want to say thanks to all the people that are sponsoring Western Standard. And, and you know, it, it makes all the difference because 
uh, the, uh, the the wages of a journalist are not always healthy, but uh, they're they're healthy for the democracy, and uh, it it helps us so much because we are not government sponsored media at Western Standard. We are uh, here because people believe in us and because we believe that the things we're saying are things that need to be heard. And uh, this is another thing that democracy and media has been really consolidated. There are ninety percent of the media organizations in North America are controlled by uh, six corporations. And so we, you know, we, we need to have more independent media. We used to have more independent media. And uh, that's part of the reason why we have a controlled message is because we have a controlled media. Right on. Thanks, Lee. And we won't be uh, letting ourselves be controlled. <laughs> no. Oops, sorry, I cut him off here there. But yeah, and Lee got ahead to what I was going to get at. And just, we got to make the plug and we do have to remind everybody. And, and thank you all who are watching. Thanks to those people who have been uh, sponsoring us. You know, we, we can use advertising on these shows. We can support local businesses through that, promote our local uh, services, products, things like that. And people need to, you know, subscribe. It helps us. We aren't getting tax dollars like the CBC. We aren't getting money like the print publications from the federal government. We are staying independent. And that allows us, you can bet, uh, Lee wouldn't be allowed to even talk about those sorts of things if we were with the uh, CBC or if we're getting funding from the government because editors would be saying, no, we're too afraid to go into those subjects. Let's stay away from it. Don't touch it even. We're not going to be like that. Uh, we're, we're not interested in reporting like that and being told what we can say or what we can't say. So that makes we're still reliant. We're relying on you guys. We're relying on those subscriptions. I know some people got a little upset still over the paywall. And I, I know, but there are a number of means you can sign up. You get a number of free... Uh, 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 articles and publications and things like that. And if you subscribe to the newsletter, and again, the analogy I use is, you know, we never batted an eye uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago on spending 15, 20 bucks a month for a newspaper subscription. And you got stuck with all those darn newspapers stacking up in your place that you had to get rid of. 10 bucks a month for all this content you're getting from the Western Standard, breaking things like the uh, caucus uh, insanity of yesterday, uh, Lee reporting from those, those those protests in Saskatchewan that you never hear of. Nathan Gita talking out of uh, Prince George and BC. We're really spreading out there. Uh, Linda Slobodian's writing in Manitoba. We're truly becoming a, a Western publication. It's because so many people have been signing up. So thank you and, and thanks for supporting a free press. Uh, I'll be back on Monday. I haven't lined up my guests for it yet, but I'm certain I'll find some interesting people to talk to. If not, you'll be stuck listening to me for a while, but I'm sure I'll come up with something that may be interested to babble about and rant about. So thank you all very much. You all have a good weekend, and I will see you all soon. Thanks.